Good afternoon, everyone. I'm watching the Zoom room fill up. Just give it a few more seconds as you all gather and join us this morning or this afternoon, depending upon where you're dialing in from. We're very excited to have you with us and looking forward to an engaging conversation. I continue to see my participant number tick up, so I'm just going to stall one more second and, and get this party started. All right, I think we're gonna give it a go. It's the top of the hour here on the East Coast. We're coming to you from the nation's capital, or I am at least. Good afternoon, good morning, welcome. I'm Kathleen Scott. I serve as the Vice President for Leadership Development and Partnerships at the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, also known as ASCU. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day and your busy week to participate in a thought-provoking and informative conversation about assessment and evaluation, the cornerstones of continuous improvement. I think we would all agree that continuous improvement sounds great, right? Sign me up. I want an improved process. I want things more streamlined. I want to be able to measure results. But where do we start? How do we get from a current state to a future state? How do we execute the kinds of transformational changes that will lead to measurable student learning improvements? With us today, we have an amazing team from our treasured thought partner ETS and from two ASCU member campuses that will break all this down and leave you with concrete ideas and practical ways to define student learning outcomes, to make inferences from data, and most importantly, use the results to create, sustain, and advance a culture of continuous improvement for student and program success. So first, please join me in welcoming Bree Doherty. Associate Dean of Curriculum and Operations in the College of Business and Technology at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. Welcome to Brie. At UNK, Brie leads curriculum management and assessment in undergraduate and graduate programs, accreditation reports and processes, transfer opportunities with community colleges and international schools, enrollment management, recruitment and retention efforts, and college communication. One of those jack of all trades, Jill of all trades, associate deans get to do it all. Um, Brie is a professor of finance and her research is Nebraska focused. We were talking before we went live on our mutual affinity for the beautiful state of Nebraska. She recently helped develop the first economic prosperity and quality of life benchmarking tool for the non-metropolitan and small metropolitan regions of Nebraska known as the Nebraska Thriving Index. Bree is joined today by Bavik Pathak. Oh, Pathak. I didn't get the pronunciation correct, uh, clarified. Thumbs up. Okay. Um, Bavik is the Associate Dean of Graduate Programs and Accreditation and Professor of Decision Sciences at the Judd Leeton School of Business and Economics at Indiana University South Bend, another proud ASCU member. His research interest is on the impact of internet technologies on business. He's been published in the Journal of Management, Information Systems, Decision Support Systems, Journal of Retailing, Electronic Markets, and Communications of the AIS. Moderating our conversation today, please welcome Katie Pedley, Director, R&D Liaison, Global Higher Education at ETS. And Katie brings more than 25 years of experience in research and most recently as the Director of Psychometrics and Data Analytics for College Board Programs at ETS. She has published numerous peer-reviewed publications, most recently co-authoring ETS Best Practices in Constructed Response Scoring. Throughout her career, she has been committed to the principles of fairness and equity in educational opportunities. A heartfelt thank you to ETS for sponsoring today's conversation. A little plug, the ASCU president, Dr. Mildred Garcia, serves on the ETS board and is very proud of the work uh, that the entire ETS team does, and we value our partnership so very much. Uh, thank you for the three of you, and I will turn the, the mic over to Katie to, to, to lead the okay. conversation. Well, thank you very much, Kathleen. Uh, that was a great introduction. Um, thanks all of you for being here uh, this morning, this afternoon. I know it's tough to squeeze these things in um, during the day, um, but what we thought we'd present for you today is really, um, what we thought would be most effective was a discussion with um, basically colleagues of yours at different institutions to get their take on assessment and evaluation and how this works. Um, you know, if you're new to this and you're thinking, how do I even start? Um, these are people who are seasoned. Um, you know, they have some some ideas and lessons to lessons learned to share. Um, you know, what are the pitfalls? That kind of thing. 
Um, so uh, the format that we're going to have today is um, we gave we we have some questions that um, they've had a chance to think about ahead of time, um, and we're just going to go through a conversation. Please feel free to ask questions. Um, we'll we'll either try to address them as we as we go, or uh, we'll save some time at the end for them. But please bring your questions. And um, I guess where we'll start though is um, I'm going to start with you, Bree, and just ask you just for context so everybody kind of understands where you're at. Can you tell us a little bit about your institution and what it's like? Yeah, so um, Kearney, Nebraska is about 37,000 in terms of population, and UNK um, is a regional residential uh, university. We're part of the University of Nebraska system. Um, so we, um, student body wise, we have about uh, 6,500 in our college, which is the College of Business and Technology. There's about a little over a thousand students with about 60% are business, 40% are on the technology side. On the technology side, we have cyber systems as well as the iTech, which includes aviation, construction management, um, industrial distribution and interior product design. So we have a variety of programs within our college. It sounds very broad. Wow. Okay. Um, Babek, how about you? So we we are. Uh, I'm from IU South Bend. It's one of the regional campuses of uh, Indiana University. It's uh, one of the largest regional campus uh, of uh, Indiana University, after of course Bloomington and IUPUI. Okay. Uh, we have around four thousand students, uh, uh, and uh, at business school we have around eight hundred uh, students. Okay, so also a, a big program. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, so uh, the first question then uh, is for you, Bavik. Um, as you've worked through a continuous improvement cycle, um, and you've done it a number of times by the sound of things, what were the biggest challenges you faced and how did you address them? So, one of the, first of all, I like the name continuous improvement cycle because uh, in most of the places we use the term assessment. Right, I think it's 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 called assessment, and one of the major challenges while implementing continuous improvement cycle is to make sure that everyone knows that the assessment is a means to an end and not an end itself. Um, the ultimate goal is continuous improvement, uh, but in many places the primary focus uh, is basically collecting data, the 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 measurement aspect of it. And that runs through the entire continuous improvement process. So I, uh, uh, typic, I, I divide the whole continuous improvement process into three parts, uh, planning, measurement, and intervention, or what we call closing the loop. Right? Uh, and uh, I tried uh, in the last few years, uh, I tried to address this, what I call measurement myopia, uh, collection of data in, 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 in different areas. So for example, uh, previously, a typical planning process uh, would include uh, six Ws, uh, what to assess, why to assess, how to assess, where to assess, when to assess, who is responsible for the assessment. That's how the plan would look like. And uh, at, at, at our business school, our assessment plan is for five years uh, because it goes through our WACSB accreditation cycle, similar okay. might be the situation at, at Breeze uh, Institute. Um, so, uh, so typically when we talk about it, we only include the assessment part of it. But what I started doing is that the assessment plan includes a schedule for data analysis and schedule for closing the loop. So everyone is aware of the fact that when are we going to collect data for each SLO? Uh, when are we planning to analyze it? And when will we have the implementation for closing the loop? Uh, or, or, or continuous improvement. So we, we start that at the, at the planning level. Uh, the uh, second uh, thing uh, uh, as a part of measurement myopia is that uh, uh, many times we think more is better. So the, we have so many SLOs. Now, realistically speaking, uh, if you have uh, five different programs and uh, you, if, you have um, uh, like a half a dozen SLOs and you try to measure them every year or every two year, good luck with it, right? It's not realistically uh, possible to do continuous improvement. Yes, means you will have a really good amount of data, but working on it, acting on it will be uh, a challenge. 
So um, uh, one of the things that uh, we, we have tried to do is basically is to reduce the number of SLOs and have focused SLOs for a certain time period. Uh, so when it comes to assessment, uh, the uh, no measurement myopia, I think that is the second uh, kind of uh, uh, aspect that we'll look into. Um, and, and no less is more. So yeah, so that, that's interesting to me. So you're you're saying that what you do is you you decide to focus on quality measurement of a few things rather than saying everything is really important. So we're going to try and measure everything. So we have um, tried to kind of yeah. spread it out in the sense mm -hmm. that every year. So this year, for example, if we are focusing on communication skills, so we collect data for communication skill uh, for this mm -hmm. particular year. At the same time, we would be kind of working on analyzing the data that we had collected in the previous semester. And uh, in the subsequent semester, we would have kind of the implementation part where we actually act on that analysis that we have done in the previous semester and implement closing the loop activities. So it's kind of staggered in that sense. Uh, okay. Yeah. Bree, does this does this resonate with you what he's saying? Do you do you take a similar approach? Yeah, I was just going to add um we we shoot for or we've specified what does a mature kind of continuous improvement process look like? Um okay. and so we say is it sustainable? So, yes, right now I'm in the driver's seat, but if I was to be removed, could somebody else take this and still run the system? Um, so in terms of simplicity, right, we need to have something down, the system down so that somebody else could step in and just and take over. Is it systematic? Is there a system? It can't be fits and starts. Uh, that's what Bavik is talking about. They have this process, this system. Um, and so what's, what is the system that is in place? And we want to continue, continuously improve that system, but we have to have a system first off before we can fix right. it. Um, is it effective? Um, so, you know, are we taking the results and then, like um, Bavik said, are we implementing, are we changing something so that we get a better uh, better student outcomes, we're helping students, whatever it is, and then is it efficient? So um, more is not necessarily better, um, but is it is it simple? Are we connected, collecting enough data and are we actually doing something with that data to help our students? So sustainable, Systematic, effective, efficient, and then the last one is: Are we, you know, meeting the requirements of our creditors? So I think right. that's, you know, what what Bobic is talking about as well. But those are kind of in terms of what does a mature process look like? That's what we're shooting for. So we're constantly asking, we're tweaking something. Are we, you know, hitting these these areas? So. Right. I really like that um, you mentioned about people being able to step into these roles and take it over without having to reinvent it. Because I think a lot of institutions face that struggle where there's turnover in roles, um, somebody's out for an extended period of time or somebody leaves a role and somebody new comes in and then the next person comes in and is sort of left to <laughs> have to figure out what, what happened or, or what's going on and they end up recreating it and it's just a lot of duplication of effort and there's just not time for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it's very important. Um, so um, along the lines of, 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 as we're talking about this continuing of improvement, obviously one of the most important parts of this is establishing your SLOs. And you've, Bavik mentioned, you know, you don't wanna have too many of them or you wanna stagger them because, um, you know, if we're thinking about this as um, really your, your researchers about your own program, right? You're collecting data and evaluating it over time and seeing how it, how it works. Um, how did you, who was involved in establishing your SLOs? And Brie, I'll start with you on this one. What was the process you used? And is there anything that you particularly liked about the way you've done it so far or anything that you would change about what you've done in terms of SLO setting? Yeah, so um, all of our, I'm gonna talk more on the business side because that's just where I have more of the experience. So all of our business faculty are involved in setting the, the SLO. So I thought I would go through two different um, examples um, of how we kind of manage this process. So one of them, um, we had an international business content uh, learning objective. And um, we got to thinking, are we really interested in our students knowing very specific 
international business content, or is it more we want them to have a global perspective, to be culturally aware? Um, and so the process that we took for this, we had been, um, the, the learning objective was the specific, and we were kind of moving to this other, in this other direction. And so what I did was I partnered with our faculty development um, committee who puts on kind of workshops, and I brought in um, some of our faculty who have um, taught international courses, have taken students abroad, you know, and so they did um, a, a workshop type thing on what they were learning, what they had learned from other schools, et cetera. And then from there, we broke people down into kind of round table and um, members of our assurance of learning sat at each of those tables. And then the faculty kind of, uh, we shifted through, rotated through, and we got people's perspective. And, and what came out of that was that we really, want our students to be more uh, culturally, you know, culture where glo this global mm -hmm. viewpoint versus the specific, um, you know, business specific content. And so we moved, but it was this, the process was important, you know, and, and that was the way we did it in that situation. Um, more recently, what we've been doing this year is actually reevaluating um, our business core curriculum, which can be a monstrous task. Sure. Um, and in this case, you know, there's three different departments. Um, I'm sure you've all had kind of turf battles of, you know, which, what classes should be in the core, which should not. And to break all of that down and to have us all come together, um, I, this was in the fall semester, I had two what I called brainstorming sessions. And it was, we're, we're coming, it's it, with ideas. There was, well, the first one was, what should the business core look like? Kind of just more of a, 30,000 foot view. So we got ideas and, and the idea was, there's no idea, stupid. We're gonna write these all up on the whiteboard. Everybody's just gonna go round robin and we're, we're gonna just continue this until there's no more ideas. Obviously after an hour, everybody still had ideas. So they thankfully wrote them down. I collected all the paper, but I you know got this all down in a spreadsheet and then we, we organized it. We found the themes and all that. And then the second brainstorming, which came out of the first brainstorming session was we really need to identify these uh, KSAs, the knowledge, the skill, and ability. And so that was the second brainstorming session. So everybody come with your ideas. We're going to just jot them down. We're going to continue to go around. In that case, we got done in about 45 minutes because everybody knew what was going on. But I mean, we had whatever anybody said is what we put down. And then we took the, the task force, took those back. I actually printed them out um, on little strips of paper and I took them uh, to our task force meeting and I gave everybody a baggie with all these and I said okay spend 15 minutes how would you cluster all of these and so everybody you know was clustering and then we had a conversation and finally we got you know a graphic of what this kind of the, the business knowledge but also kind of this support like we need to to develop them on a personal level and then get them ready for their job ready for their internship and so there's kind of this support you know, classes to help. Um, and experiential learning is very big in our college. So trying to infuse that throughout the core um, as well as into the emphasis area. So those were two um, specific um, examples of how, um, well, one was the specific international uh, learning outcome. We're still getting to the final business core, you know, how we're gonna reevaluate this. But um, I noticed with these brainstorming sessions, rather than, you know, kind of one department's over here and other department's over here. I felt like the tension in the room just it okay. kind of let everybody was, we were having a conversation and it, it, it went very, very well. And then now this semester as the task force is pushing forward with some of these things and every month we invite the faculty to a forum and we educate them on, hey, this is the direction we're taking. What's your thoughts about this? And so it's overall, it's, it's worked very well. So. so it sounds like you've reduced the, the sense of territoriality that people are feeling when they come into these processes. And then you're also giving lots of opportunity for, for input so people feel like they're being heard. Yes. And I have to say, you know, we kind of had a thought about what direction we could take. Um, and so we, the task force kind of put that forward. And then everybody is like, wait, we're moving too fast. We're moving too fast. And so then we've kind of gone through this, uh, this process. And I don't know if we're really all that much different from where we started, but I've learned it's the process that's so important and letting everybody have input into all of this and feeling that everybody's on board. So 
-hmm. if I've learned anything, it's the process is very, very important um, yeah. as we go through okay. this. <laughs> as it as important as the content itself yeah. almost. Yeah. Interesting. Bhavik, did you have any thoughts on this one? Go to Bhavik. I think, oh, sure. question I think is worth pausing because it's directed um, to Bree and what she just spoke about. Mm -hmm. Did the faculty volunteer for the core LO task force or did they get assigned? What fraction of the faculty were involved? If we just want a little more detail mm -hmm. on um, those workshops and sessions that you just described. Yeah, so um, the dean um, identified the, the faculty he thought would be good to be on this task force. We wanted um younger faculty who i mean this is their future so it, that was kind of part of it younger faculty but not you know too young that they don't feel like they can speak up because of tenure promotion sort of things um and then it was a, somebody from each department so it's actually a very small task force which is helpful that we can like move and get stuff done but we typically after we meet every other week and we usually go back to our departments and inform them or if there's not necessarily something we have to go back to the department, then because I'm the, the chair of the task force, I will go out to the specific faculty. Like maybe we're having an issue with one of our questions. So I will go directly to the relevant faculty, get some input, get some data, and then bring it back to the task force. And then, like I said, every month we have that forum. And so then we're reporting out. Um, so having the, 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 the meeting with the task force every other week, but then also having that forum really makes me stay up on it and, and push this, um, you know, to, to get something done. Because as you guys know, sometimes curriculum changes take forever, but it's, it's forced us all to like, no, we're going to get this done. There's deadlines, there's meetings, so on and so forth. So. Right. Thank you. Bhavik, did you want to, did you have anything you wanted to add to this one? Uh, so um, we have slightly different, I think uh, Bree has uh, addressed one aspect of it. I'm pretty sure she might be doing the, the other aspects as well, but slightly uh, different approach here. Um, uh, our SLOs are kind of uh, stemming from the, the strategy, strategic planning that we do. So every uh, five year, uh, we have kind of a new strategic plan. Uh, now it has become more agile in the sense that we, we have to keep on kind of looking at it uh, more frequently, but we, we come up with the new strategic plan and we use that time to review our existing SLOs. So that's, that's, that's the starting point. And when we review uh, the existing SLOs, we look into a few things. Our performance uh, with respect to those SLOs during the previous time period. So that's that's one thing. Uh, second thing, any modification that we need to make with respect to the, the, the new strategic plan or revised strategic plan that we have. And the third aspect that we do uh, almost during similar time frame is that we conduct a, a survey of our uh, alumni and also our, um, uh, our, our employers in our region. And we kind of uh, send our as current SLOs and ask them about the importance or significance of, of, of those, those SLOs in, in the current work environment. So we get those feedback. Um, we also receive feedback from our um, uh, accreditation board about our assessment process and, 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 and the weaknesses and strength and stuff like that. So we incorporate those into it as well while looking into the SLOs. Um, and subsequent to that, uh, we have curriculum committee, assessment committee. Uh, they, they review uh, this SLOs, propose kind of some revision uh, if and when required. And then we present it to the faculty, uh, get their approval. So it's a little iterative process, uh, but uh, uh, that, that's the process that we follow. All right. Well, if we're going to tie this to, uh, we're going to have to tie the SLOs to assessment at some point. Um, so Bree, we'll start with you on this one. When it comes to assessment and evaluation of your of your SLOs, so you just talked about a situation where really the 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 general content area was the same, but it sounds like the level of the of the type of skills and knowledge that you're expecting to people have people to have has changed. Um, what were your biggest challenges um, with with um, evaluation of these new SLOs? Yeah. So um, I, again, another example. Um, I think at least when I first came into this role, you know, I'm collecting the data and I'm analyzing the data and, and 
you know, we're, we're going on and we're, we're seeing how we're doing. And then it was like, oh, well, we're not meeting the performance measure on one of our specific um, student learning outcomes. So in this case, it was oral communication. And so um, we had a rubric that had been, um, you know, approved that we were using and the rubric only had four items on it. So it was delivery, professionalism, um, kind of the visual aid piece of it, and then the content and analysis. And so, you know, I, I analyze the data and I see that on some of these measures, the, the students aren't meeting the benchmark. And so then it's like, okay, well, they're not meeting the benchmark on delivery. Why? So I think it's the why. Why aren't they meeting it? And in this case, we started sifting through all of the comments from, from the reviewers. They were saying a lot of ums there, you know, whatever it was. And I was like, well, this rubric is basically not effective for helping us get at the why. And so in that case, what I did is I, I took um, the information back to our Assurance of Learning Committee. And I said, I think we need to have a more specific rubric. Like we need to identify what is it when they give an oral presentation, what are we looking for? And so I just took a stack of sticky notes and I said, write one, you know, what we're going to spend, you know, however much time we need to write down one trait on a sticky note until you run out of traits. Um, and so we did that. We spent, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes just writing all this down. And then we just went kind of a round robin. And I, again, I wrote, I took the sticky notes and we, we organized them. It's like, well, they say, so things that we want to see or we don't want to see. So for example, we don't want to see lots of ums. We don't want them to be looking at the, the screen. Right. right. But you, I thought, you know, so all the eye contact and um, how how loud you are, et cetera. Are you engaging with the eye? So all those things. So there's probably over 20 different items. And so now we've been using that rubric and it's it's so much easier that, um, you know, on several of the items, they're not, you know, meeting expectations. And then it's a matter of, OK, well, we need to work on, you know, like maybe it's let's practice before we have to give our presentations because we're, there's a lots of ums going on. You're not speaking up, you're, you're reading off your slides, you know, so it's very specific. We can diagnose where they need help. Um, and so that was one approach that we took, but I think the biggest challenge for me when I get the data, it's why are the students not meeting, you know, it's not always obvious. And, and that was right. a specific case where it wasn't necessarily, we did a, a whole heck of a lot to improve this, the student presentations. Um, it was, we improved the system by having a better rubric. And then right. now we can figure out, okay, this is where they're struggling. Um, you know, I guess another example we learned um, when we assess our online students versus our face-to-face, -face, the online students, they'll just have their screens right here and they'll just be reading. It's like, that's not a presentation. And so we gave better instructions. Like you have to be recording yourself as you're presenting in front of a fake live audience or whatever it is. And so we had to be very specific with the instructions that they were going to be doing it as if they were in a, a live presentation. Okay. So in one sense, you've improved the quality of your own information for diagnostics. So you didn't immediately address, you couldn't immediately address why, why the problem was, but you improved the quality of the data. And then in turn, you improve the quality of your instruction by, by it sort of tracked back that way. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. nice. And then for me, when I am, the students in my class give the, one of the presentations that is collected in this. And so I just, you know, we kind of do, well, I do a kind of a test run. They have two presentations and it's the final presentation, which is the one I, I use for assessment, but I give them a test run. So like, mm -hmm. hey, let's let's get up in front of everybody. Let's, okay, everybody, there was quite a few ums going on. A lot of you are reading the slides. So it's it's to an education time for them to get right. ready for that, that final presentation. Nice. Babic, how about you? I think I have a similar example to what uh, Bree mentioned, and this is especially with respect to oral and written communication, we had exactly similar problem, but this problem was compounded by the fact that we want these assessment instruments to be as objective as possible, but when uh, oral written communication was being uh, assessed in different sections in different courses by different instructors, 
there was uh, no consistency. Um, uh, so th that was one of the major issues that we identified. And um, uh, how to address it? And sometimes finding problem is sometimes difficult when it comes to assessment. And then once you find the problem, how would you address it? That's the other aspect of it. So we did something similar to what Bri uh, did. Uh, we tried to find an instrument uh, that has not necessarily the best definition, but there is some sort of definition of what do we mean by clarity? What do we mean by concise uh, uh, communication? What do we mean by persuasive uh, uh, communication? So there was a some definition given there, which most of the faculty would be agree with and, and also uh, students uh, can easily understand. So we started adopting that rubric that has helped us in bringing some kind of objectivity in the assessment. Uh, so that's that's one of the yeah. challenges that we addressed. Um, this is actually an issue that we deal with a lot in large scale assessment. You know, you guys are talking about assessments that you've developed within your own institution, but obviously ETS as an, a, a large scale you know, assessment company, we deal with this a lot in scoring essays and scoring videos and that kind of thing. And one of the things that we find really helpful, um, especially when you have people that are, you know, not everybody's going to, if you look at a rubric, you may look at it and think, oh, this is clear and I understand what this means, but so does everybody else, but they don't necessarily have the same, the exact same interpretation. And so what we find helpful is if you have um, developed exemplar materials where you say, um, this person has a particularly good example of this in their, in this case, oral performance or something like that, where um, everybody who's going to be scoring these can kind of come together and discuss them and agree on them. And then everybody can refer back to them as they, as they're using the, the rubric. Um, we find that we, we find that really helpful. Um, it's more challenging, obviously, in a, in something where they're maybe scoring something live, but if people have that opportunity to kind of see those exemplars ahead of time, it just helps kind of calibrate everybody. Um, so that would be one one suggestion that that might be helpful for people. If you can if you can get those materials together, it really does help align people a lot better. Um, okay, before we go to the next, there's a couple of questions I think related to some of the area the ground we just covered. The first came from Snowy Potsdam, New York, and I think this was directed mm -hmm. to comments, um, Bhavik, that you made a short while ago. And this was wanting um, our, our participant wanting to hear more about the role of the assessment committee, particularly in reviewing and approving the the SLO plans. So uh, I think the role of the uh, means someone has to take uh, charge, right? So so when it comes down to the SLO revision. The assessment committee is 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 the one that coordinates all all the aspects of it. So we look into the previous cycles data. So that's that's one thing. We look. We conduct like as an assessment committee. We conduct surveys of alumni and uh, and and employers. So we collect that data. Uh, we are aware of the strategic uh, plan changes. And then we kind of, in, in the assessment committee, we have representation of uh, all different um, uh, departments within business school. So we kind of discuss those issues. Uh, those issues are also discussed with the executive committee, with all the department chairs and everyone. And then we decide about making changes on, on, on the SLO. So as the assessment committee's role is more kind of coordinating, getting input from everywhere. And and kind of uh, uh, becoming uh, in charge of this this whole whole project. So that's that's the role of assessment committee. We don't make a decision per se, but kind of uh, coordinate all the activities. Uh, we we need to get uh, uh, stakeholders approval right uh, at, at at every stage. So indeed, and thank you for that clarity. And Bree, the next one was for you about the um, the rubric. So do your faculty members object to having a centralized rubric? Does everyone require to use it in their courses or do people volunteer to submit evidence of achieving LOs from some courses? So a little more clarity in what you're describing. Yeah, so if it's a rubric that we're using for our assurance of learning process, then everybody is using the same rubric. And so part of that, um, you know, we have the the committee who's doing the work, but then we take it back to the departments. Each each department has a representative. And so there, there's back and forth with departments. So the faculty are reviewing it before we finalize it. But um, yeah, if, if your class has been identified as, so for example, the oral communication, it's, it's difficult to have 
or identify a course in the core that they're doing a, a solid presentation. Most of the time, this is in the emphasis area, so like accounting and finance. So we have to work with the faculty in those upper level courses so that we can get a sample across all of our business disciplines. Um, and so, yeah, those faculty agree to use our AOL rubric. Thank you. Okay. Sorry for the interruption, Katie. Back oh, to no you. Problem. No problem. So, um, so speaking of assessments, um, Babak, what criteria did you use when you were selecting assessments? Did you have any special criteria? I think you touched on this a little bit. Yeah, so I think, uh, and, and we are talking about assessment instruments here, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in, yeah. in that sense, I think the first thing is the validity, right? The, mm -hmm. uh, the instrument should be able to measure what's uh, intended to measure, right? That's, 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 the, that's the most crucial part. So as much as possible, we try to use um, uh, uh, standardized instruments like value rubrics. Uh, we do have ETS test, for example, which has a validity. Uh, we, we use kind of indirect assessment tools as well uh, uh, of our stakeholders. They have worked out well in the past, and, and, and if things are okay, we don't change it. Uh, we also look into the practicality um, uh, in terms of uh, the time, cost, and available resources. Uh, so for example, one of our uh, faculty members was super excited about a leadership uh, assessment, which was costing like $100 per student, right? And, and uh, it's not sustainable in the a, in a, in a, in a, in a long run. So unless we have some specific grant, it's a separate issue, but it's not sustainable. So we look into that. Um, uh, other practicality that has come up is that one of our uh, faculty members was was researching on teamwork and and used uh, a, a kind of a teamwork related rubric which was driven from uh, one of the latest research paper. So uh, yes, means it was implemented for his section for his class, but it was more kind of the uh, individual specific. Uh, some uh, later on, if the instructor changes it will be difficult to implement that kind of rubric. So we look into those kind of practicalities uh, as well. Uh, and, and the third aspect that we kind of look into is the actionable intelligence, right? Once the, the data, once you get the data, can we act upon it? Once, or is it a black box? That's that's the that's the other aspect that we we look into, and it's 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 a, it's a challenging. Once when we comes down to actionable intelligence, it requires a lot of efforts to find out where exactly the problem is. But that's the third aspect to look into. Yeah. And Bree, how about you? Yeah, I agree with everything you said. We, this, the the mo the main one is. For example, in that international content, um, we had been using the MFT, but then we switched to the intercultural um, diverse uh, intercultural competency and diversity um, instrument mm -hmm. because that's what we more wanted to measure. So it's about right. trying to find this is what we want. Do we mm -hmm. is there something out there that we can use, or do we need to create it internally? So right. um, and weighing the cost, weighing, you know, all the, that stuff. So. Said sure. it yeah, yeah, I think you, you know, everybody wants to drive a Rolls Royce, but a Toyota Corolla is pretty good. <laughs> it gets the job done. <laughs> um, so um, now I'm a, I'm a psychometrician by training. So this question is near and dear to my heart. I think everything about assessment is important. Um, but is there anything, Bhavik, I'll start with you. Is there anything you did not know about assessment when you first started that you wish you had? So this is particularly geared to people who are thinking, I'm I'm just new to this process. What do I need to know about assessment? So it's a complex process, first of all. And it, it, um, uh, uh, unless you work on it or do it, and uh, uh, it, it, it's tough otherwise. Uh, so uh, many times you learn when actually you do it, right? Otherwise, the process-wise, it seems simple that you know you measure data, you analyze it, you close the loop. But when you actually act on it, then you you see the difficulty or complexity uh, behind it. Um, I did talk about uh, uh, the criteria for selecting the instruments. Um, the Problem that I have started seeing recently is, is uh, the reliability of many of these instruments. And what do I mean by it here, the reliability? That the instrument is valid, 
uh, it's intended to measure a few things and it does measure those things, uh, but it's not producing consistent results. Now, this has become a kind of a, an issue recently in the last four or five years that I'm noticing uh, because of uh, different types of modalities and different types of programs that we have started having. Uh, we have collaborative program wherein multiple regional campuses develop a program. Uh, we have mixed modality in our program. Some sections are in-person, some sections are online, some sections are hybrid. Uh, synchronous sections, asynchronous sections. What works in synchronous section is not working in asynchronous section. So now, now the assessment was a complex process, but now with all these mixed modalities, uh, it has become more complex. And uh, um, uh, I haven't found a kind of a, a magic wand yet, which can fix all these issues. Uh, but uh, what we are doing now is basically uh, encouraging faculty to write their own reflection and, 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 uh, and provide more lengthy narrations as well to make sure that we understand what's going on. Um, so that's, that's, that's one, of the, one of the challenges that, that the assessment is having. Um, in terms of uh, a new person uh, getting into this role, uh, uh, many times getting data, I think what Bree mentioned is very important that uh, uh, establishing and putting process in place is also a very big deal. Uh, if, if, if I, if I uh, leave this institution or if I'm on a sabbatical for one semester, means this thing should continue, right? The process should be in place. Uh, we should be able to collect data. Uh, earlier, I mentioned that there is a measurement myopia, but at least the measurement should be done. And sometimes, right. uh, sometimes you don't have proper process in place, and 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 you're not able to get get the data. Buy-in means uh, developing good relationship with the colleagues, you know, because everyone is busy doing their own thing, and now you are asking them to do this assessment. Uh, very frequently or, or curriculum changes means they, they have to buy this thing in. One of the major problems that happens is we keep on collecting data and assessment becomes a bureaucratic process that, oh, this is just one more form or one more report that I have to file in, right, if we don't act on it. So we have to make sure that we, if someone someone tells us this is a problem, let's, we have to put some good faith effort to fix it. Those are a few uh, a few things that uh, needs to be kind of uh, um, addressed when we are uh, doing this continuous improvement process. Okay, thank you. And Bree, uh, similar question to you. Is there any advice you would give to a continuous improvement rookie? Um, yeah, I think I would say invest in yourself. Um, there's a lot of webinars out there. There's a lot of uh, seminars, workshops. I learned a lot by going to well, Karen Tarnoff from East Tennessee State University, she helped me tremendously with the, the ASSV um, AOL seminars that she did. Um, and I even went out to, to Tennessee and visited her, spent some time with her just to learn because she's in a similar situation. Um, it's a business and technology. So kind of all the accreditations across all of our programs. So that was very, very helpful. So invest in yourself, learn what you need to learn, um, but also you gotta just get in there and try it. I think one of the things I was afraid of was I was gonna break something. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, you feel maybe a little paralyzed. You're like, ah, I don't wanna do that because am I gonna break it? But um, the thing that I did was asked, why, why are we doing it this way? Is there a simpler way that we could be doing it? So my whole goal has been, let's simplify this. Let's make this systematic. Um, I, when I stepped into it, I felt like it was daunting. And in part of it was just because it was new, but I invested in myself, um, wasn't afraid to like ask why um, and how, how can we simplify this? And I guess um, you kind of have to fly the plane as you're building it. And that's just part of the process. So don't be afraid to just jump in and get your get your hands dirty yep. all right well thank you this has been really great um we so that, that brings actually brings us to the end of our questions and in almost perfect timing if i'm if i'm going to self-congratulate um <laughs> for our question and answer period so um i don't know kathleen if there are other questions or 
Um, I don't see any yet, but I want to invite, invite all of our participants. If you have questions, bring them on. We've got some amazing subject matter experts and storytellers here. So we encourage you to leverage that community and, um, and the opportunity to ask your questions. So there is no such thing as a bad question in this environment, our safe space of, of learning and supporting one another. And maybe while we wait for those questions, Katie, you had some resources from ETS. Do you want to share those, or we can send them as follow up, whichever you're. Um, yeah, I have I have some uh, some follow up materials that I think might be helpful. It would really be like a, a little presentation, I think, to go through. Um, so I don't know if we want to go through it too much, but I do have some some information here about, um, like for example, when you're trying to align your um, when you're trying to align your SLOs to um, what kind of assessments you want. Um, one of the things you have to go through is figuring out like at what level are we trying to measure this? Is this really surface level where we just want students to have an awareness of something or is this you know higher order thinking? Do we need them to be able to integrate or um, you know synthesize something new? Um, and so we have a few different types of, you know, most people are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, for example. I have a few other examples of other taxonomies that might be helpful. Um, I do have a little bit of information about things like, um, you know, when, uh, Bavik mentioned reliability. Um, reliability in psychometrics and in, in assessment means something very specific. Um, most people understand validity generally. Reliability is a little, a little bit more um, nuanced, but really, it's it's really about um, is this measurement going to be consistent? And validity is sort of the be all end all, but of you know if, if it's not measuring what you want, it's not a useful measure. But reliability is often thought of as kind of the the limiting factor on validity. So if it can't if it measures what you want, but it can't do it consistently, it's not really that useful to you because you don't know if you can trust trust your results. So I have a few definitions and that kind of thing, and I'll very happily share those. Um, so uh, so we can pass those on, but I hope I've so stalled long enough for us to have a question. <laughs> no questions yet, but I, there was a, um, we did post in the chat that those materials you just referenced, we'll make sure we send off to everybody okay. that participated on the call today and everybody that um, registered for, because we know the life of all of you, um, yeah. the crazy lives that you're living, some that perhaps you registered and weren't able to join us live and catch this in a recorded in our recorded version later, um, we'll be sure to pass those materials along so that you have those resources. It's our commitment to continue continue to support you all in the frontline work that you're doing to serve your communities and your students. And we're able to do that because of the generous thought partners that we have like ETS. So we'll make sure you have those resources. Katie, I'm not seeing any questions. Is there any further conversation you want or was, some closing thoughts was, before we wind there down? There was one more, one more question I just wanted to ask. And it, it, it's just something that um, we've been thinking about. Um, in your um, setting of your SLOs, um, you mentioned, Bavik, I think you mentioned having external, um, you know, alumni and um, and external partners who might be in industry or stuff like that. I know we have talked about, both of you talked about having a lot of faculty involvement. Have either of your programs considered including um, some kind of student representation of, of existing students in your SLO setting? So it looks like... Uh, uh... Uh, we we haven't kind of surveyed our existing students. I think we okay. uh, we we kind of surveyed our alumni because they are in the job market right. and, and okay. they 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 have experience of what the industry kind of wants. Uh, they have gone through our program. They have kind of a full picture. They appreciate those uh, in uh, things as well, um, and and of course the employers, but. Uh, yeah, because we haven't explicitly kind of uh, involved our existing students in building okay. SLOs. We do include them in our strategic planning process, though. Okay, so they so sort of indirectly they have that that influence. Yeah. Okay. I would say ours is the same. Um, and when we survey our alum, it's a at least two years out, so they're pretty close, but they're not obviously okay. current. So they're everything's fresh in their yeah. in their minds. Yeah. Okay. I think you talked um, about this earlier. Are there resources or trainings that the the newbies to this space, um, to college or institutional level assessment, um, could could access? And and we can put that in a follow up email. But just if there are things that come to mind, we have a question in the chat related to resources for trainings. Well, I would say um, in terms of the, the accrediting bodies, usually they've got 
good seminars throughout the year. And most of the time there's one on assessment. So I would, I mean, I mentioned the AACSB one. I, it was excellent. I learned a ton from that, but I'm sure the other accrediting bodies also have those sorts of seminars. So. Yeah. We have, we also last fall offered a, a webinar series um, that talked about um, mapping SLOs and assessment. Um, it was free and it, it's been recorded. So I can also make sure that when I send the slide deck that we send that, uh, that information along as well. Excellent. Thank you, Katie. People want to go to those webinars. Yep. All right. I think we're going to wind down. Any closing remarks, thoughts before I wrap us up? No, other than to say thank you so much for Bria and uh, Bavik and their thoughts on this. This was really um, interesting for me. I hope it was as interesting for everyone else. It was wonderful. Indeed. And thank you to you, Katie, and to ETS for bringing us today's conversation. Um, a big thank you to Brie and Bavik for making time to be with us and sharing your stories, your lessons learned, best practices. Um, certainly a, a, a great safe learning community. And we appreciate you both being a part of this and, and um, answering the call with yes when asked you calls. Um, this recording will be posted. So if you have somebody in your, um, on your college, in your campus, in your network that you think would be find it of value, we'll make sure that everyone gets the link so that you can direct it to your friends friends and colleagues. Um, and I encourage you to watch your emails for additional opportunities to learn, to connect, to engage um, with the various um, things that ASCU is doing to serve our members. So leverage that network. We're here for you and we recognize the extreme challenges um, that most campus leaders are facing in today's environment. Couple of quick uh, commercials, if I might. Uh, we have an amazing uh, symposium that's coming to our DC offices next month in March, on March 27th, with reception and dinner, followed by a full day of learning, um, all focused around meeting the urgent needs of today's students. So we're gonna look at the, some, the latest research on how to create a sense of belonging for black and brown male students. We're gonna dive into student success models. Um, and this is a symposium that's open to residents, provosts, and other student success leaders. So that kind of captures a lot of different roles within the academy. So that's going to be in DC. You can take a look at that. And then um, we have our annual academic affairs summer meeting coming. And I think this particular conversation really resonates with the theme that we're offering. So we're bringing the meeting this year to Baltimore. So join us in the mid-Atlantic, steamy summer, steamy summer in July in Baltimore. We'll be right on the waterfront. That conference is taking place the 19th through the 21st. We're currently accepting pop calls for proposals. And the theme this year is the courageous new world of teaching and learning. We're being inspired by the effects of many of the factors that you're all um, struggling with that are really um, challenging the heart of the academic mission. So everything from developments in artificial intel intelligence to the impact of educational gag orders to prohibit teaching on certain subjects to the effects of political polarization, the rise of extremism, the effect, after effects of the pandemic on students, faculty, et cetera, et cetera. So a real deep dive in teaching and learning. And we encourage um, our listeners and, and everyone to join us in Baltimore, but also to consider submitting session ideas, um, whether you come in as an individual or a team from a campus or multiple campuses, we want to create the richest learning and community building opportunity that we can in your service. So with that, we are going to give you all seven minutes back in your day. Speaking of assessments, please be sure to provide us feedback on today's session. Um, my colleague popped a link in the chat and we wish you all a wonderful afternoon and thank you so very much. And hopefully spring is on its way wherever you've dialed in from today. Thanks so much. Thanks thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.